Welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to this episode of The Roundtable. I'm your host, Michael Hicks from Ball State University. We have with us today in studio in Muncie our guest, Jennifer McCormick, who is Indiana's Superintendent of Public Instruction. So welcome, Jennifer, to the show. Thank you. Glad to be here. Well, before I get to some really tough questions, tell me a little bit about what brought you to the place of being Indiana's Chief Academic Officer for want of a better word. So I started out in the classroom. I taught special education and language arts for 10 years, moved into administration, was an elementary principal and a local school system superintendent for seven and a half years and got at the point where I, uh, we were at with the state that I thought maybe I could help out with some service at the state level, ran for office, and so here I am. So all the fun behind you, now you're at the state level exactly. doing this sort of thing. So, so you have about, what, 1.2 million students here mm -hmm. in Indiana, about 70,000 teachers, and they're spread out across, what, 296, 295 school corporations around the state. Um, and these range from extraordinarily rural school corporations mm -hmm. with three or 400 students to uh, in really very large urban districts of 30,000 plus among the top 10% of the mm -hmm. country. Um, what's the single issue that worries you most across all of this here in Indiana right now? There are a couple things, but probably the thing that we are paying attention to right now is access to opportunity. So whether it be courses, funding, humans, you know, teachers, great leaders, it's that access. So we pay attention to that and look at our role to how can we help with that. So that is one that we just know if you're sitting in a really rural area or if you're in the urban, suburban machines, it's very different. So we want to make sure we're leveling that playing field. And so um, what specific, you, you go ahead and give me number two. You, you said there are a couple things. So that's number one, access. That makes a lot of sense. Yeah, that's, access uh, to opportunity and with that right behind, it's obviously funding. So when we're looking at our funding formula in Indiana, we have worked very well with Senator Mishler. We're having a lot of conversations with Doc Brown and Representative Houston as well um, regarding where can we look at that formula, what makes sense, what do we need to tweak a little bit, but the funding is always going to be a concern because schools are expensive. Well, and we talked a little bit about off camera about some of these issues. And so if you're thinking about funding and you're thinking about access, what does, could you give me a couple of uh, ideas about how you think uh, Hoosiers should think about school choice. So Indiana has maybe the broadest state school choice in the country. You can go to school in any Indiana school corporation. Mm -hmm. The money follows the student. We have a charter system that are public schools that can be opened and attract students and attract that base funding for each student. And then we also have vouchers for students, for low-income students going to private schools. So What's your feeling about, not so much the philosophy of school choice, although you can talk about that, but how is that playing out? What's that doing in Indiana? Where are we now after eight years of, of pretty uh, extensive school choice? It's interesting because the conversation needs to move away from just cho choice for the sake of choice to more quality choice. So we're trying to put some guardrails and parameters, which isn't always popular in our state, regarding if we're going to have choice, let's make sure there's some quality assurance to it. So maybe that transparency and reporting, whether it's academic or you know financially, we think that's important. So everything we're doing is around the conversation of quality. It's interesting too when we're looking at where does that point come where it's saturation? So where does that hit where, you know, our human capital is a problem, our facilities are heavy, um, you know, our operational costs are getting quite heavy, but we continue to open new schools. And so we're doing a lot more with a lot less with capacity. And so we're paying attention to some of those numbers and helping educate those who are policymakers who are making some really important decisions. Right, and so if, if, as I look at the school choice map, I see charter schools mostly concentrated in the larger urban centers, mm -hmm. so Lake County, Marion County, and then in four or five, about 90 percent of them I would say are in five mm -hmm. or six counties. And then we have private schools in, in every county. Mm -hmm. And we also have e-electronic e schools or, or, or schools of, with e-learning. Mm -hmm. How does that figure into this and how many students do you reckon that we have that are really going to a, 
a charter school or a private school that's an e-learning school? So our virtual charter high schools for the first time, they're the second largest high school in Indiana. So those numbers are exploding. We have about 15,000 students who take advantage of that. Our concern again is the performance of those schools are, are quite a challenge. Um, onboarding for those students and making sure parents understand the demands of that different type of learning has been a challenge, but the performance is dismal. Many of them aren't participating in state assessment, so it's hard to gauge that. Many of them are extremely mobile, so we're also tracking those kids who are at one school for 20 days, popping to another school, going back for 15. You know, it's, it's, very, it's a concern. So we're looking at that. They, they really aren't going to get caught in our accountability system because they're really not participating or attending enough to get caught in the accountability system, but those numbers are exploding. The other piece is the charter schools we're paying attention to because as quickly as they are opening, they're also closing. And so with that takes common school loan monies that's getting very expensive for the state because they don't have to repay that back. We're also watching those vouchers. The number of non-pubs that are opening is quite interesting. And we go out and look at that for accreditation and some of the situations are concerning in some of those and, and across the board, including traditional publics, we have concerns. But we're watching that quality piece again, but the numbers are very fluid and uh, with the charter and the voucher, what we're seeing a lot of is mainly suburban white taking advantage of that. And it makes sense when you talk about resources to get a student from point A to point B and the means to educate yourself on, you know, how are we going, what schools do we want to go to? The, the um, really the metropolitan areas that really had a heavy choice at the beginning, that's all leveled out. So we also have concerns again with access and, and do we have truly choice for all students? So uh, the demographic of the students at the, the virtual school, that's gonna range from schools that students that may have physical handicaps, they can't really make it to school, they may have social issues to keep them out of school or this is an alternative to ex being expelled. Uh, what are the other types of things that might drive children into a virtual school? Experience? Medically fragile students take advantage of that. Sometimes it's short term, other times it's long term. We have athletes who are at the Olympic level that take advantage of that type of environment so they can travel and hit, hit their schedules the way they need to make them. And so there are different reasons for it. A lot of what we're seeing, because traditional public schools have to have that exit criteria, making sure we know where those kids are headed and trying to inform them well. Many of them are just either running from discipline at times or they're upset with their school that they're in and they look for another choice and so those are the kids too that we're seeing the most mobility so they go and they attend per se they're enrolled at a virtual school but then they're right back popping into another school you know two weeks later so there, there's a cycle there that we need to pay attention to and really start putting some better parameters on. Right, and that's, I, th I would say, would you characterize this as normal after eight years? Is this experiment and not f failed or succeeded, but rather still in disequilibrium? Is that how you might characterize it? Yeah, I, I would, and I think we have to be careful because we have virtual charter schools and then virtual programs. Right now, Indiana's kind of lumping them together. So for instance, we have schools that are 100% virtual charter, which means that's the only method of delivery and they're out of sight a teacher at their home, taking those courses, a different method. The virtual programs could be within a comprehensive high school that are for credit recovery or EL or special education population. Our fear is virtual education is getting lumped into the same concerns of virtual charter schools and it's very different. Right, and I've seen, I've seen that. I've had a son who did some, some, some of the virtual schools. That's a good way to get summer school if Absolutely. you've got a job mm -hmm. and you're traveling with a sport. Um, so you, you've talked a little bit about the differences geographically. Do you see you know, there's been a lot of work. We've actually published some studies on um, the challenges of very small school corporations. There's a, a fixed cost associated with running a school that's significant. And so uh, the sort of studies that both our office and Purdue said you gotta be about 2,000 students till you exhaust those. And then after that, the per unit costs don't, don't change an awful lot mm -hmm. with scale. There are other factors that, 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 that worry that cause differences in cost, but are, are there geographical differences about what you worry about? What are your worries? Let's, let's start with rural schools, suburban schools, and urban schools, and can you maybe just talk about your worries or concerns yeah. with them? Yeah, so we'll start with rural. So about 36% of our districts are still deemed to be rural, but only about 26% of our kids are sitting within those schools. So it's an interesting dynamic where we are still having to pay attention to policy because access to opportunity is huge. Many of those schools are also 
letting us know to find quality leaders, quality teachers, bus drivers, the list goes on, is very concerning. We're also worried about just the curricular offerings that some of those schools have access to. And so that's uh, some of those online options for some of those areas is extremely important. We hear a lot of conversation about can you share resources within rural schools? And a lot of that's being done, but there's also a practical side of that. If you have to travel 45 minutes one way to share a resource of a course, it's problematic. And so we're, we're working through some of that, but there are some real concerns of our rule that their declining enrollment is a huge problem. So those conversations are still happening and trying to get them access and capacity. With Grad Pathways coming, they're very concerned that some of the bigger urban machines have such an advantage to say, our kids can graduate and they may have 15 different options to do it. In a rural setting, you may have three. And so there's a very big difference on just what's expected right now from the state of Indiana and what you have access to. Suburban town schools are still relatively performing well. Um, there's not a huge concern on access right now for many of them. They're trying to figure out partnerships that many of them have not been exposed to in the past because they didn't need to necessarily. So they're doing a much better job of, of that piece of it. So our suburban town schools, I'm not as concerned about. Our urban machines are very concerning. We have a lot of mobility that's still a concern. Discipline is still a concern. And so we're looking at what's smart policy, helping out with chronic absenteeism. When we look at our schools across the board, that's the area that probably sticks out the most because of the attendance issues. And so how do we provide better support and programs and, and try to support our urban machines with, with chronic absenteeism, it still is a concern. We're also doing a much better job of working with law enforcement for some of our urban districts as far as absenteeism, as far as health care, as just trying to work as a whole family. And so we'll continue to do that. But the needs are very different based on obviously where they live. So I'm hearing flexibility, flexibility yeah. in public policy seems to be a, a, a concern of yours. You're heading into a budget session. Mm -hmm. Indiana has a biennial budget. And so um, what are your priorities for funding for Hoosier schools this year? So obviously basic tuition support or tuition support is going to be big. We put a big number on that, knowing that they're telling us the revenues don't look good is very concerning. We also have a STEM ask, which would benefit all schools across the board. So we had a little bit of money earlier on from the governor's office. We're asking for 10 million a year in that area just to help with vetted curriculum and professional development that schools are desperately in need of. Our EL population and our pre-K special ed, we asked for more dollars per child in that arena because we're still struggling to get results and provide the services needed. Our students who are most at risk, our S5 kids is what we call for special needs that are identified that are maybe housed in another state for services. That too is getting very expensive. We asked for additional dollars there. So across the board there were just a lot of a lot of big dollar amounts that we were looking at and obviously were very expensive being over half of the state's budget, but our biggest charge is that tuition support. So that then it allows for that flexibility of schools to decide where that money goes. Right, do you have any particular, um, if, if there's one thing you could do, would it be that, that basic support? It would be because again, it allows for schools to take care of those costs that they need. STEM is gonna be big for our state. We are telling, you know, we have a lot of demands in IT, engineering, a lot of those higher level professions that are saying you need to get the critical thinking, problem solving, communication, collaboration, all those skills. STEM fits nicely in that, but we need some finances to help support what's happening in our schools. We'll probably come back to that budget question, but if we, if we think about the, the 10 years that we've been in, say 2008, to, to 2018, is the beginning of this, Governor Daniels, then Governor Daniels really pushed the Indiana Commission on Higher Education to generate extraordinary push for excellence. And so we see that in mm -hmm. the change in the diploma, the share of students going to AP classes, and all the other things that would drive a larger proportion of students to be college ready. Not necessarily go, but, but, but be prepared for that. And we, we think today, the states may be emphasizing more just secondary attainment and then maybe a modest post-secondary uh, education, CTE training, so a certificate coming out of high school or elsewhere. What, 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 what's your thoughts on that? What are your concerns and where do you think the state gets it right? 
So uh, for us, I think, and the responsible answer needs to be academic rigor for all students. We need to push them to their academic capacity, and sometimes that's not comfortable, and sometimes they have to make choices they don't like. And you have to have buy-in from communities to push that rigor, but I think we still need to shoot for the rigor. Governor Daniels did incentivize that. We had dollars that followed academic honors. He put a big, big push on advanced placement and dual credit. And I think a lot of those things that he did, he did it for the sake of pushing that academic capacity and making sure we were we're really incentivizing toward four-year degrees. And so I understand now the, the swing is happening, but we as a Department of Education, we've got to stay realistic and rigor still counts. Rigor matters for that long-term earnings for the child, also just their lifetime earnings obviously are, are, is going to matter. We have to pay attention to what they're interested in and their passions and not just fill a workforce based on today's needs. So we have to be careful as a department not to re knee jerk that we're looking long-term for students and making sure that we are maximizing our capital so that we can do a better job for the stu for the schools. Right. Well, and, and um, we've come from talking about these issues in front of an annual forecast, mm -hmm. and among the things that uh, I've pointed out is that we've seen very static earnings uh, over the past two decades here in Indiana. So it doesn't really matter what's your level of educational attainment. Uh, they've been fairly static, but there's a, a vast difference. So a a college graduate on average is going to earn twice that of, a, of someone who has not been to high school and about 60% more than somebody just has graduated. People who have a two-year degree or some college earn a bit more. And so uh, right now we've gone from, if memory serves me, about 45% to about 55% of Hoosier children are going on to post-secondary education. Are you getting feedbacks from colleges about how this has been over the past 10 years or where could that be improved? You know, part, some of the positives with that, the need for remediation has gone down, maybe not as quick, quick, quickly as we would like to see it, but it has gone down, so that's a good positive sign. We're looking, we're working with the Commission of Higher Ed to look at more transition courses to make that more seamless, more in the math area where we're seeing a lot of those struggles. So that partnership is stronger than ever, and I think it's a good time to embrace that, to say we have still got to keep our eyes on a prize for that academic rigor and really pushing some of those, uh, you know, that academic idea of a four year degree. So we will still remain having that academic rigor and having that academic capacity conversation, but we're doing a lot of things well. Um, I know we're still worried about, you know, we're getting kids into college, but that completion rate is not what we want it to look like. So I know the Commission of Higher Ed is still paying attention to that, but from the K-12 perspective, we're getting them there. Well, that's, and that's right. On, on being on the other side of it, I think many of the things the Indiana Commission of Higher Education has done has made us more aware mm -hmm. of some of that. And what's interesting about it, um, we'll talk about staffing a little bit, is that there's been a push for both to reduce the excess staff to staff to instructional staff ratio at the college level, and I'm sure at K-12 as well. But one of the things we found is that we get students, if they're exposed to counseling that's professional, mm -hmm instead of just a professor doing it who may have other interests and needs to be in the classroom doing research, mm -hmm. that that actually did a dramatic uh, uptick in our graduation rates, the speed to graduation, because students learned earlier about what courses they had. If they were indifferent between two majors, we forced the more rigorous courses on them earlier. We made sure that they scheduled out the full four years when they walked in so they could see what they had to do, and so the cost of a semester uh, they thought about those things earlier, but those were staff members. Those professors didn't do that. Uh, mm -hmm. You know, it's not widely known that professors aren't taught to be counselors <laughs> in their PhD program, so maybe that was a good idea. Do you are you thinking through the, some of the same issues? Because I know counseling has been something both DOE and the Lilly Foundation have pushed. Is that uh, adding that counseling staff? Is that making any of this better or is it's it too a huge early to difference so counselors their plates are full but some of them will tell you we maybe aren't as equipped as we need to be for that career navigation and career exploration conversation so it starts way before high school just with that exposure piece and we're getting better at that but you know our, our lily's been a great partner but we're like what happens when those funds are gone so we worry about the sustainability schools were to have a plan but we also are realistic in how do you keep that going and so that is an area that we are also trying as a department to keep a focus on our group at, at the division there that focuses on the social emotional is also helping helping with that but it definitely is an area of need we're we're getting better but we're not where we need to be no okay and that's a good answer i think that's um kind of as a parent of high school children that's kind of what i see that they're getting more interesting exposure mm -hmm. but it's 
the amount of time the counselors have with each student in a mm -hmm. high school is a matter of minutes a year. Mm -hmm. And so they do an astonishingly good job to be able to do that. But more on staffing, we've talked before about teacher shortage and teacher um, understanding the dynamics of employment needs in the public sector are very different than the private sector. In the, in the private sector, um, if wages are rising and you're not getting the people you want, then that's evidence that you really don't have the people that you need. And, and, but in public education, you don't really have the pricing mechanism in place. Some of that is because you're not generating your own revenues, at least mm -hmm. as easily as a business is. And then secondly, there are many restrictions on how teachers are paid. So you can't oftentimes offer the high demand teacher a, a better starting salary because of local contracts. So can you tell me your worries with the, the, a potential teacher shortage? Where do you see it happening? and what fields maybe is it occurring and geographies as well. Yeah, so the piece that we're losing 35% of our teachers in year one through five, and when we ask, you know, what, what is the reason? The number one reason was 88% of them said it's pay. Many of them said it was just preparation. Some said support in the classroom with autonomy. So there were some other reasons for that as well, but we have to pay attention to that. The pay difference amongst rural, suburban, town and urban schools is very different. So some of our ur rural schools are maybe $32,000 for their first year. You can go to Indianapolis and maybe start out around 45. Needs are different of the child, workplace situation is very different, but that salary looks very different as well. So we're trying to find areas that we can be of support with that professional development. How are we gonna attract people into the field? How are we gonna do a better job of bridging? You know, there are a lot of programs right now through IT engineering that they're doing a much better job of getting high school kids exposed and keeping them hooked in and then that bridge to higher ed is much easier. We're saying why aren't we doing that as an education profession? So we're doing a much better job with per ed professions one and two to bridge that into a university. We're just waiting for that first university to bite and it's going to be and it's going to go. So we're working on that partnership to say how, how can this look different than basically what it has looked in the past. So there are a lot of exciting things happening but also how do you keep the, the experience teaching? teachers in. You know, if we start losing all of our experienced teachers and our young teachers are leaving in year one through five, we're in big trouble. So ha that incentive to keep them in, we're still working on them, but again, it, a lot of times it takes dollars at the table. Right. It is a, it's always a research issue, mm -hmm. even if it's, even if the expressed interest is, mm -hmm. I'm not happy with the control. Well, that's a compensating differentiation. Mm -hmm. If you get paid a little bit better, that might, yeah. you might be more willing to put up with what is a very technically challenging and fast changing career. Um, and some of our schools have gotten much better at those high demand areas, special ed, high school teachers, I mean some of the areas, much better at finding some incentive dollars. So we have to do that in order to survive with some of those programs, but some of our schools are getting much more creative with that. Well, um, uh, let me ask also, we'll go back a little bit to students. How, what are, what are your thoughts on the pre-K push and where we are with that, and what are the sort of milestones that we would have to do? Where should this look at the end of the day? Should we have 100% of three-year-olds in, in, in a public school setting or a private school setting, or should, should it be 40%, and what part of that maybe ought to be the state's responsibility and what our parents? We were pushing for an expansion of that. I know not every county's touched, not even half the counties are touched, but we were looking at the data that they're getting is pretty impressive. Now we're working on the assessment end of things, but the data they're getting on some of that early return on On My Way Pre-K is a good start for that K-12 piece. Understanding funding is always going to be an issue in that arena and the appetite of whether they're going to go all the way or not with that, it's still going to be there in Indiana, but we do ex we do support the expansion. Many schools in the counties that they did not receive dollars support, state dollar support are finding ways with partnerships in their local areas or through their K-12 dollars to try to figure out how can we service those families. The need is there. Families are very aggressive with wanting that assistance, whether it's paid or half paid. So our schools are doing a much better job of partnering and many of them are running those programs, but we do support that. It just makes a difference. We still have kids that come into our schools at the age of seven that have not been exposed to an education and that's very, very difficult. Or we have those coming in at five, coming into kindergarten that are simply not even potty trained. So we have such a vast readiness coming at us and how we react to that, but that pre-K piece is pretty important. And that's interesting. I'm going to tie that back. Among the, the, the major criticisms of America's workforce development system is that in the comparisons to Europe isn't in the, the later end training, it's the early training. Mm -hmm. So Europe does where they do a better job of education than us, and I'll argue that's not true universally, all eight, nine-year-olds who are cognitively able read. 
and so we don't get there. Mm -hmm. We don't get quite close to that. And the, the approach that is used across most European countries today is to focus resources on students as they slip away from, as they get older and are not reading. Is, there, um, is that a per persistent problem here? Do, are you seeing in, in schools having any innovative ways to deal with that, or is it just a resource issue? I think it's a big problem. So it's interesting, 93% of our third graders pass the IRE3 on the first go round, much higher percentage on the second. But then we turn around, and some of those very kids are having trouble passing our I learn or I step third grade in language arts. So it's very interesting the dynamics of the assessment piece and how that's playing in. We have started a more aggressive MTSS, which is our multi-tiered systems of support in the area of literacy. We have developed frameworks, we're providing more support. Schools are getting much better of reading the data, making sure they have quality data that they're making those decisions on. But then you have to have a viable curriculum that can get you results. So Yes, we're doing a much better job, but that's another area too. We're not there yet. We have a ways to go, but it's extremely important. And like I said, we're aligned with the governor in STEM and CTE, but that's one of those areas in literacy that we cannot take our eyes off of literacy as a state. Right, I, would, I, I heard you re speak about that earlier, and I think the 93% the, um, sounds like a big number. In Britain, it's 99, 100%. Mm -hmm. And so right. that makes a vast difference in the earnings capacity mm -hmm. because children just aren't going to get out of mm -hmm. school what they need to if they're just slipping past into fourth grade. The curriculum is driven by the capacity to read. But the, I, but the I step three, grade right. three, is much lower than the 93%. Right. So the alignment is people are asking, how can that be? You know, so we have a lot of questions to ask or to answer. <laughs> right, right. I understand you're working on that. And we just have a, a minute or so left. If you, you are in commanding, a, not quite commanding, but the <laughs> education, we're, we're spending $9 billion a year in Indiana. Yeah. Um, what would you do? What, where would you put a billion dollars? If you had one thing or two things that you could spend it on, where would you put that billion dollars to make the biggest long-term effect on public education in Indiana? So if that was kind of our wish list, we would hit the early literacy hard and also the early STEM hard. So those are two areas that we know from our K-12 system that we are struggling, early literacy and that STEM piece. We're getting a lot of that right in the later years, but K-8, we, we can't assume they're going to hit high school and be prepared. So those early years and that formative piece, those are two areas that we need to get right. If I had a little extra money, I would off, put it, a lot of it in social emotional learning, but I, I could argue that a lot of that can be done through the STEM and through the early literacy pieces. And so that's, if you have, of all the K through 12 and pre-K, it's just, it's literacy at the six, seven, eight year old those are the where you would put a billion dollars. I would put a lot of money toward the early literacy and early STEM efforts. Thank you. That's uh, maybe that's a good way to to leave it. Um, so I appreciate you you coming on on with us today. I'm your host Michael Hicks with Dr. Jennifer McCormick, uh, Superintendent of Public Instruction. And until we see you again in the next episode of the Roundtable. <laughs>